And today we will talk about um, eBPF and then um, basically how could you use that for cloud native security. Uh, so who is speaking today? My name is Natalia. I'm a security product lead at Isavaland. And then uh, John couldn't make it today, but let's give him some credit because he is doing a bunch of work under the hood. So he's a Tetragon lead, Cilium maintainer, long time kernel engineer, and then staff engineer at Isavaland. So a little bit about the agenda, like what we are going to explore today. So first, uh, we will take a look at how you could secure uh, application on cloud native environments, what are the main challenging challenges, and then what would be an optimal solution. And then we will take a look at like uh, how eBPF comes into the picture, like what is actually eBPF, why eBPF, eBPF-based projects that are already exist, and then we will take a look at uh, Tetragon that we are working on at Isovalent right now. And then how could you use that for um, security observability in cloud native environments? And then we will uh, take a look at like some quick wins that your security team can implement. And then uh, I will show you a couple of uh, quick demos. So securing applications on cloud na native environments. So first of all, um, how would you secure this? So this is the cloud native landscape as of 2022. I took this picture last year. So if you take a look at this picture, probably you might get overwhelmed, right? Like there are a lot of applications running and so on. But prioritizing the project and the application where you have the most risk and the least trust is probably a good way to get started. So basically, uh, secure the basic components first. And then, um, what are the main challenges right now on cloud native environments? So first of all, the problems that the traditional network monitoring tools, the tra traditional network layer tools, are based on IPs and ports. So Kubernetes workloads are containerized, and basically IPs and ports are not meaningful anymore there. IPs are dynamically changing all the time, and then basically it doesn't provide like any meaningful identity. So we would need a solution that would bring identity into the Kubernetes world. So this solution would leave IPs and ports behind, and then this sh solution should be also like easy and efficient, and then basically available for everyone to use. So how comes eBPF into the picture? And then basically, what is eBPF? So I will start with a, a small intro to kernel architecture. This is going to be a one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not a kernel engineer, so I also don't know this into uh, in very detail. So basically, we have three space. User space on the top, kernel in the middle, and then basically the hardware. I put storage and network over there, but there are like many, many more. I tried to simplify it as much as I could. So what the Linux kernel would do as a first step, so it would abstract this hardware away by using so-called drivers. So the Linux kernel has to be aware like uh, what a storage driver is, what a network uh, uh, driver is, but it doesn't necessarily need to expose that logic to the user space. And then uh, it needs to enable it, so it needs to say like, okay, I'm aware of like block devices, I'm aware of network devices, I'm aware of console, but it doesn't need to uh, expose that complexity into user space applications. And then on the top, we have actually user space where you have your application running, and then basically it communicates to the kernel with the kernel by using so-called system calls. So basically, when you are doing, for example, like a file I/O, it's using syswrite and then sysread. And whenever you are like actually making a network connection, um, it's using send message and then receive message, for example, to um, open a TCP uh, socket. And then in the middle, we have actually the middle word, the business logic. For example, virtual file system, the process scheduler, TCP IP, firewall technology. So what if I would like to change that logic? 
like what if I would like to add a new Linux kernel feature? For example, if I am an application developer and then I want a new Linux kernel feature to actually observe my Kubernetes workloads and then provide, for example, um, security on that. So I can actually go to like a kernel engineer and then ask him like, hey, can you implement this new Linux kernel feature for me? And then he will happily do that. It will take some time, but this is fine. But after this implementation done, he actually needs to convince the entire community that the feature he's actually adding is useful, it's needed, and basically the rest of the world should be paying the complexity that he is adding. So it will take a year, more or less, but then once the changes are in, it's actually fine. The Linux kernel now supports this. And, but I, as, a, as an application developer, need to actually convince my users to upgrade to the, Linux, uh, the latest Linux kernel, which will, while depending on my users, will take like, I don't know, five years or something like that. But after this like five years passed, everyone upgraded, it's actually fine. Now they are using it, but the problem is like, nobody got actually five years. So what is eBPF and then how would it change with eBPF? Um, so what eBPF allows to do, it's actually pretty amazing. So if you remember like on the previous, uh, on the previous slides, we have actually the user space application and then how it's communicating um, with the kernel is actually via system calls. So for example, you have the accept a system call and then it's used to launch a new process. So for example, if you're running Bash, and then you want to run, run like Veeam, Nano, Top, PS, whatever you want to call it, uh, Bash will actually run the exact system call, and then it will actually open the Top or PS binary. And then basically the scheduler will fork that process and so on. So what we can do with eBPF, uh, we can actually take over that system call and then run a BPF program on behalf of it, and then return. So we could do something like this. We can execute a BPF program on the return on the exact system call and extract some information. So in the example, I just put like PID binary name and then com name, but we can extract like so much more. And then we can export this uh, information to user space. So this is basically how, for example, application profiling and then tracing works. Okay, so how does it work in detail? Like, how do we actually execute code inside the Linux kernel? So as a first step, I will go from left to right. So we have some bytecode. This is actually the compiled version of the code snippet that you could see um, on the previous slide. So as a first step, you, could, you would need to load that code inside the kernel, and then this is done by a, a BPF system call. And then once it's loaded, it's actually going to a verifier. So this is uh, provided by eBPF, and then it makes sure that the BPF program that you are loading, it's not buggy. So it will not crash the kernel. Um, and then if the BPF program is buggy, and then it will crash the kernel, it's not going to be approved. And then once it's approved, it's going to a so-called JIT compiler, a just-in-time compiler. So at that time, the bytecode is actually like generic. It can run on ARM, x86, SX86 whatever um, your CPU is, and then it's going to comply to, uh, to the architecture that your CPU runs. And then once it's compiled, you could actually attach it to the system call. So where can we attach BPF programs? So I was only talking, talking about system calls, but there is so many more places where we can attach BPF programs. So I will just start from the top. You could attach to user, user space application functions via uprobes, so-called user space probes. So for example, if you have an application and then uh, you would like to actually instrument a function and then run a BPF program on it, you could actually do that and then extract some information like statistics, data, metrics, whatever. And then you could attach to system calls, you could attach to any kernel functions with k probes and trace points, and then you could actually go deeper on the network device layer and then offload that to hardware. Great. 
So now we can actually run BPF programs, like inside the kernel, but like how do they communicate with each other? So it's important to note that BPF programs are only the instructions. So it doesn't contain any data, it doesn't have any state, there is no, for example, memory allocated on the fly. So what it does, it puts any state into BPF maps. And then I put a couple of examples like hash tables, arrays, ring buffer, stack trace, longest prefix match, least recently used, um, and so on. So any BPF program can access these maps, and also like user space application can access these maps. So for example, if you have a user space agent or a CLI that is running in user space, uh, it could read data from these BPF maps. And then what's important, like these BPF maps are completely separate from the program. So if you upgrade the program, these BPF maps actually stay alive. So it allows you to, for example, um, have like a seamless upgrade. Okay, so how kernel development would look like with EVPF? I'm still an application developer. I still need a new feature to observe my app. So I can actually go to like an EVPF developer ask this feature to implement it. He will actually happily do that, and then he will just release a new version of his eBPF project. I can apply it, and actually, I don't even need to reboot my machine. So that's actually great, and eBPF is actually a widely used technology. It became cross-platform with the recent Windows runtime, so it can run on Windows machines as well. Most Linux distributions support it, and basically all the big cloud providers. So uh, Google, Amazon, as well as Azure. And then a lot of eBPF projects are out there. If you are interested in, just go to eBPF.io and then check out the landscape. I put a small subset here, but there is like this would give you a glimpse like what can be done with eBPF, but there is so many more out there. So I put networking observability and security here. So let's start with networking. So it's used mainly for high performance and the load balancing. So for example, there is Catron, which is like a high performance load balancer from Facebook, and they created it to replace IPVS, which is a software-based load balancer. So they actually switched to eBPF, and they saw like a massive performance increase. And then we have Cilium, which is basically um, networking connectivity load balancing um, for Kubernetes services. On the observability side, you could do, for example, application tracing, performance troubleshooting, performance monitoring. So the first two is BCC and BPF trace. So these are most like figuring out what the application is doing, what my system is doing, why it's not behaving the way that it should. On the right side, we have actually Hubble, which is the visibility component of Cilium. So it's used for, for example, um, network troubleshooting, network policy monitoring. So figuring out like which, which connections were dropped by which network policy, which connections were actually allowed or denied. And lastly, um, you could use eBPF for security, like container runtime security. So you could hook on any kernel function and system calls and then detect suspicious behavior. You could actually implement least privileged policies, so uh, observe what your application is doing uh, and creating a profile that these should be the events that are allowed and basically prevent everything else. And you could also use it for preventative security, so you could terminate on any kernel function and system call like inside the kernel, which was originated by, for example, a suspicious behavior. So I put three examples, Tetragon, Tracy, and Falco, and then we will deep dive into Tetragon later on. So Tetragon is actually like an agent. It can run on the top of any Linux operating system. So in case of Kubernetes, it's actually a daemon set. And then in case of like Bermata VMs, it's actually a container or a system D managed service. And then it just mounts a bunch of configuration files for um, security observability. So if you take a look at the picture, like there are a lot of layers where we can extract data from. 
So starting from the lower level layer, we have um, data access, file access. We have a bunch of network parsers like HTTP, um, DNS, TLS. We have visibility into um, kernel nam namespace changes and then capability changes like privilege escalations. And then we have visibility into any system call activity as well as process execution. So all these events would eventually go as JSON events into a log file. And this log file later can be integrated with, for example, any CM system like Elasticsearch, Sumo Logic, Splunk. Um, you can export it to S3, create signatures. Um, and then we have basically metrics, Grafana, Prometheus, OpenTelemetry. So these are mostly the networking use cases. And then what's important, so this is completely transparent to your application. You don't need any code change. And then this can basically run on as its own. So what events do we actually care about? So I listed a couple of here. And then basically any malicious activity that matters would do at least one of these things. So it's network traffic, file I.O., running executables, system call activity, changing privileges and namespace boundaries. And yeah, let me know if I miss something. So as an example, this is how like a security JSON event would look like that we extracted from the kernel. So as I mentioned, like in Cloud Native, um, we, were, we would be interested in like Kubernetes API of our metadata. So for example, namespaces, pods, labels. And then we would need also the OS level process visibility information. So we, so we need to figure out like what was the process that initiated, for example, that malicious activity or network connection inside the pod. And then, of course, we have visibility into network connections and the NS server metadata sometimes. So in the example, um, we could actually see that, for example, a TLS v1.0 uh, connection was detected coming from a source pod on a namespace. So this uh, version of TLS should never be used because it's like really old. And then for post-processing, you could actually sp export these events into a CM system. You could do, for example, signatures on it. Or, for example, during a demo, I'm just going to parse it like via a CLI. So quick wins. So on cloud native environments, there are a couple of, couple of quick wins that your security team can do or could monitor for. And then this would actually give them like uh, a lot of benefits. So first, I will talk about unexposed services. And then the second and third will be related to Kubernetes API server and then the Kubernetes dashboard. And then first, we will take a look at, or the fourth, we will take a look at the cloud provider metadata service. And then basically, the last one will be education to your team. So let's check the first one. It's uh, unexposed services. So the threat, threat scenario here is like your platform team is learning Kubernetes. They need to deploy a Redis service. And then they just type like load balancer instead of cluster IP. And then boom, your Redis service is exposed to the internet. So how could you actually catch that? So you should monitor for connections that are coming from uh, the internal network from the sources that you actually trust, and then basically take a look at everything else. So I will show you like a quick demo that I did, and then how could you actually um, catch it with Tetragon. So if everything goes well, like you should hear the audio. So as an example, I set up the uh, Kubernetes guestbook application on the guestbook namespace. So if I take a look at the pods on the guestbook namespace, we can actually see a front-end related one, which is uh, used to actually visualize the UI from the guestbook application. And then we can see the Redis related one, um, which is used to store the data from the guestbook application. So we can see the Redis leader um, pod, which is a single pod. And then to be able to um, make it highly available, I added two followers. So we can actually take a look at these services on the guestbook namespace. 
So here we can also see the front end, um, which is exposed by a load balancer. And then here we can see an external IP. And then I can just quickly check if it's really working. So let me go to the browser, type the external IP. And then we see that it's really working. So I can type um, some string like welcome to scale 20x and then submit it. So now if I go back to the terminal, um, I also see that the Redis leader service is exposed by a, a load balancer. So I can actually just try to ping that database from my local machine. And before doing that, let me just try to observe um, the events from Tetragon. So let me start observing the events and then it will observe the events from the Redis leader. And then let me just um, try to ping that database. Okay, we, we actually see that it's re it responded. Let me try to generate some data. And then in the bottom, we can actually see that the uh, send message and the closed system call was invoked. We can actually see the source namespace, which was guestbook. And then we can actually see the source for the Redis leader. And then we can actually see um, the binary, like which executed um, that system call. And then we can see actually how many bytes per send. So basically, this is the Kubernetes identity information, the uh, process level information, and then basically the system call level information. Cool. So that was the first use case. So let me just jump into um, the second one. So the second one will be Kubernetes API server. So the threat scenario here, of course, you can get like a co pod compromised. Someone can actually store the token or there is like um, vulnerability actually in the Kubernetes API server. So what you could do, you could actually monitor connections to the API server and then basically audit whether it was coming from a trusted source or actually not. So let me just try to show you the second demo. So in the second demo, I have a simple application running on the Italian jobs namespace. I have some services like Recruiter or Elasticsearch and Kafka, and I have a simple database like Zookeeper. And then let's assume in this scenario that the Kafka pod got compromised, and then this is what we can see on the right terminal. So I can actually try to uh, query the Kubernetes API server from that pod. And then before doing that, let me just try to observe um, the security events from Tetragon uh, from the Kafka pod. So let me just try to do that first. So here I will start observing the um, events from the Kafka pod. And then here I will try to generate some traffic to the Kubernetes API server. So I won't have the token, so probably it's giving us like 403, but for generating traffic, it's actually good. And then what we can see um, in the Tetragon events, we can actually see that the curl process um, started from the tenant jobs namespace from the Kafka pod. And then we can actually see um, the TCP connect system call. We can see the system car related information like the uh, source and the destination IPs. We can see um, in the middle the TCP uh, send message system call invocation. We can see also the Kubernetes identity information so that it was coming from the Tenant namespace from the Kafka pod. And then here uh, we can actually see like how many bytes were sent over. And then we can actually see that the um, socket closed with the TCP closed system call. And then we can actually see that the process exited. So if we uh, take a look at it, uh, we can actually see the Kubernetes um, API server IP here. And then we can actually see the Kubernetes identities um, on the left hand side where the connection was coming from. Cool, so going to the third example. 
it's going to be about like Kubernetes dashboard. So it's like highly sensitive. Uh, it contains a bunch of information like manage and troubleshoot your applications or like you manage your clus cluster itself. And then let's say your platform team exposed it also like via load balancer. So you would actually need to monitor like who accessed it, like when, and then basically uh, what happened after. So as a third example, I set up an insecure dashboard on the Kubernetes dashboard namespace. So that's what we can see on the top. So if we take a look at the pods, we can actually see the dashboard metric scaper and then the Kubernetes dashboard pod on the Kubernetes dashboard namespace. And then we can actually see two services, one for the metric scraper and then one for the Kubernetes dashboard. We can see that both services are exposed to the internet via a load balancer and then we can actually see the external IPs. So I can take this uh, external IP and open it from the browser, but before doing that, let me just try to observe the events from the Kubernetes dashboard uh, pod from Tetragon. So let me try to do that first. And then let me open this uh, external IP um, from the browser. So we can actually see that it was successful. We can see, for example, daemon set deployments, pods. Um, we can see ingresses and services. We can see secrets um, under config and storage. We can actually see cluster related information, for example, cluster roles, cluster role bindings, um, network policies, uh, role binding, role, and so on. So if we take a look at the terminal again, uh, we can actually see the events generated by Tetragon. So these are related to the TCP send message system call. And then we can actually see here the Kubernetes dashboard namespace, the Kubernetes dashboard pod. Um, and then all the system car related information. And then basically the source IP, the destination IP, and then how many bytes were sent out. So these are related to the uh, connections that I made previously in the browser. And then basically listing the uh, different kind of services and configurations that are um, that were accessible from the dashboard. Cool, so as a first example, uh, it's going to be related um, to monitoring the cloud provider metadata service. So as we all know, it's like highly sensitive and then contains critical information about your cloud native environment. So in a similar way, you could actually monitor like who access this metadata service and then uh, when did it happen and what happened basically after that. So in the last example, the setup will be the same. I have a simple application running on the Tenam, jo Tenam Jobs namespace with a couple of services like Recruiter, Kafka, Elasticsearch, and the database with Zookeeper. And then we can assume that the uh, Kafka, got, Kafka pod got compromised. That that's what we can see on the right terminal. And then I can generate some uh, data to the cloud provider metadata service. But before doing that, let me try to observe the event um, with Tetragon from the Kafka pod. So let me try to do that first. And then from the Kafka pod, I can generate some traffic to the uh, cloud provider metadata service. So let me try to do that. And then if we can take a look at uh, to the events that were created by Tetragon, we can actually see that the uh, curl process started with the appropriate arguments um, that invoke the connection to the cloud provider metadata service. We can actually see the Kubernetes identity information uh, like the Kafka pod and the Talon jobs namespace. We can actually see um, the TCP connect system call also with the um, Kubernetes identity information the process information, as well as the um, source IP and the destination IP. 
uh, we can actually see the TCP send message system call, uh, also the Kubernetes identity information, then on jobs and CovCom, also the curl process, as well as the source and the destination IP. We can see that uh, 79 bytes was sent out. And then we can actually see the TCP close system call with actually the same information. And then we can actually see that the process exited. Oh, so as a last example that I actually like wanted to call out, um, it's actually like educate your team because like in security, one of the threat scenarios is people. So what you can do, like do CTF exercises. These are fun. Do red team, blue team exercises, also very fun. You could do like interesting and then uh, useful webinars, maintain security awareness because it in the end, it all comes down to people. And the more effort you actually put into your people, the less cost is going to, that you're going to um, pay. So basically wrapping up, I didn't plan this for like a one hour session. So we saw like what are the main challenging challenges on uh, cloud native environments when you try to secure your application. We saw like what could be kind of like an optimal solution. We saw what is eBPF, how does it work, um, not in very detail, but like in a quick one-on-one, -on -one, how could it help? We took a look into like eBPF uh, based projects and then we saw some quick wins that you, you could do with actually Tetragon. So Lastly, like how to contribute. If you want to join the community, go to Slack channel, go to the GitHub repo. We have like, um, we, yeah, you use the tool, report bug, bugs because we have bugs. So create feature requests, uh, your user experience, um, improve documentation. Um, we have a lot of um, layers across the stack that you could do. So it's not actually like Linux uh, kernel or BPF, BPF code only. You could do, for example, Go system coding, um, Kubernetes related stuff, documentation, and so on. Uh, and if you are st still here, just come to our booth and say hi, and then I will open it for Q&A. Okay. Yeah, questions? Okay, yeah, I don't know, like, should I bring the mic or? Yeah, I think you can just ask, I can hear it maybe. Or do you want to like, you can just like pass the mic to each other, like I don't. I've never said that I'm a quiet person. <laughs> <laughs> but the others could hear it too. Yeah, yeah. Just go ahead and then pass it to the other guys. Um, so the question I had was um, with respect to deploying eBPF through a bunch of different servers that are ma maintaining uh, Kubernetes clusters that are all connected, um, how do you keep those all in sync? How do you keep the BPF programs like up to date, like between Kubernetes clusters? Right. Yeah. So. You know I talked about like BPF maps, so you keep the maps up to date because these contain all the information, the state that you basically need, and then basically um, the BPF programs would read from that map. And then basically how you actually manage those BPF programs, you have some kind of user, like minimal user space logic, and those user space logic is managing the BPF programs and upgrading. So for example, in Kubernetes environments, you would have like a daemon set, and that daemon set actually injects the BPF programs and then messages, and then those would be the same actually like cluster-wide. Thank you for your talk today. I have been, I'm curious just because of another project that I was on at one point, do eBPF programs have a, like, do they have a, a memory or compute expense? Like, yeah, I, obviously they do when th something <laughs> is triggered, but what about when something is not? Like, if you just have an idle application or if you're watching yeah, other things so, like yeah, system very, calls. Yeah, very good question. Like, this comes up a lot. 
So this is why you need actually like kernel engineers, so they know actually like how things work, and then you would actually need to hook on certain functions, not on all of them. And then basically the performance that it would be, just like the per performance would be on that like function call only. So that's why you actually need to like work with the right guys who actually know how the kernel looks like, how the subs subsystem looks like, and so on. I, I probably have deeper questions, but I'll just yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I'm not a kernel engineer, so I don't know about that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so since it, you're you're basically like a generic system called tracing and policy enforcement yeah. system, is there any effort to like replace App Armor or SE Linux or something with this and sort of convert? Yeah. So what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what we see? I mean, so what we see? I can tell about like a bit, like how our our users are using this. So it's most around seccomp. So seccomp is like very static, and then I see a lot of use cases around like replacing seccomp. You so just use like a daemon set and then dynamically apply policies, and then you don't need to do anything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much guys for coming.